Hello, Kidney Warriors. James here from Dadvice TV, your online kidney health coach, and this is Dadvice TV Live. Now, for those of you who are joining us for the first time, welcome. It is great to have you here. Make sure you subscribe to the Dad Vice TV YouTube channel and hit that little bell notification. That way, every time there's a live show or something new uploaded, you'll know right away and you can go in there and learn all about living great with kidney disease. Now, for those of you that are new, let me quickly introduce myself. My name is James. I am a kidney warrior and I like to say I'm kicking kidney disease to the curb. Now, I was diagnosed about three and a half years ago with stage five kidney failure. And I was told dialysis was my future, but I have never gone on dialysis and I've never gotten a transplant. Instead, I put together a great healthcare team. All my doctors, a renal dietitian is the most important person for me. And they helped me learn how to eat healthy, how to be healthy, how to stay active. And by focusing on my overall health, my kidney labs, my results have improved and my symptoms have gone away. Now my kidneys are not better. They're still shot. They're never gonna get better. But we've kind of learned to live together and be friends. I don't put too much of a burden on my kidneys and they keep up with me so that I can keep loving and enjoying life. Now the key to all of that for me really came down to eating healthy learning how to eat and to not be afraid of food just because it's got a little potassium in it or, oh, I can't eat that, I can't eat that. No, 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 no. I learned about portion control and how to make smart choices, how to read labels, how to get food to fit into my diet. And that's what we're gonna talk about tonight, how you can learn to eat healthy, to not be afraid of food, to understand more about what nutrition means to your body and to help us learn all about this. The most important person of my healthcare team is a renal dietitian. So that's what we have here tonight. Back with us again from Plant Powered Kidneys. Please have a huge giant welcome for renal dietitian, Jen Hernandez. <laughs> Hey, James. Hi, everybody. Very, very excited to be back here tonight to chat with you all about the renal diet and focusing on protecting kidney health. That is what we are all about at Plant Powered Kidneys. Now, if you have no idea who I am, and this is the first time you're meeting me, my name is Jen Hernandez, and I am a renal dietitian. So I am a registered dietitian here in the United States, and I'm also board certified in renal nutrition. I have spent the majority of my dietitian career with people in all stages of chronic kidney disease. And no matter what stage a person is at, there are a lot of great nutrition opportunities for a person to feel better. And in many cases, for their kidney function to improve and for them to eat more foods that they enjoy. And that's one of our favorite things at PPK is teaching people about how to include more foods so that they feel better, they have more energy, they're not scared of the renal diet. It is, it's just amazing. We see it all the time. In fact, one of our Plant Powered Kidneys course students just sent us a, a private message that said her GFR is continuing to increase. It's gone up over 10 points since she's taken the Plant Powered Kidneys course. Yeah, I know. It's so, so exciting. So we love seeing this at PPK. And I do want to let you know that we are getting ready to start enrollment for the next Plant Powered Kidneys course. It's a six-week course, and it's all online. Part of it is on demand. It's self-paced. You can watch the videos when you're ready. And then we do live Q&As. And then all along the six weeks, we have recipes, meal plans, and additional content. We are opening up enrollment soon. But it's really important that you get on our wait list because the wait list is going to get the first opportunity to sign up and they're going to get exclusive offers to enroll at the lowest price. So if you are interested in joining this course and in, in taking the next six weeks, we're going to go through the end of April into the beginning of June to teach all about the fundamentals of a kidney protective diet. This is the time to join. I really don't anyone to, I don't want anyone to miss out on the savings because these are this the savings are going to go 
unfortunately, it's going to be increased and we want you to jump in right now. Yeah. And I'll tell everyone out there, you know, for me, eating right, not being afraid of food was what helped me to live with my bad kidneys. And with a, a group like this, like what Jen offers, these classes, you will learn so much about how to eat, how to pick foods, not how to eliminate foods. You're not going to be sitting there with a list of foods to avoid. You're going to mm. learn how, oh, I love avocado. How can I make avocado fit into my diet? And we're all different. You can't just follow what somebody else is eating and what someone else is doing, but you will learn the tools that will be with you for the rest of your life to help you not be afraid of food, to be able to go out to dinner with friends and order from the menu and feel confident that you're making smart choices. So I encourage everyone, if you are not working with the renal dietitian, this class is excellent to give you the skills that you need and the tools to start eating healthier, improving your overall health, not just your kidney health, it does so much for you. And when it comes to eating, that's one thing we still have control of. Our kidneys did not take that away from us. There's a lot of things we kind of feel we lost control of because we got to go in, we got to do the labs, we got to do this, got to do that. But when it comes to making choices on what to eat, we have control over that. And you're going to learn how to continue to feel empowered, to enjoy eating and looking forward to it. So hopefully that encourages some people who are out there who are, are on the fence. Yeah, we, we definitely, uh, we do like to answer questions. So if you are wondering if the course is right for you, you can reach out to us in on Facebook, on Instagram. You can reach out to us through our website at plantpoweredkidneys.com and we will help you make that decision. The course is not for everybody. If you're on dialysis or if you have a, a young child with kidney disease, those are different specialty cases that you might pick, well, I know you would pick up some gems from the course, but it is not my prerogative to have just everybody enroll in this course. I want to make sure the right people get in here. And if you're not sure if it's right for you, you can reach out and chat with us and we'll help explain a little bit more and help you come to a decision on if it's the right thing for you. But we do offer the course international. Our dietitians can only work with people inside the U.S. for a, a variety of dietitian regulations. <laughs> but for the course, this is an online health program that we are able to offer internationally. And we have a lot of international students and it's really, really fantastic to have our community. One of the features of the program is having this community that's not on Facebook, not on social media. It's completely off social media, but students can connect with each other and post questions, share their homework assignments, which by the way, I do give homework assignments, but it is all because I want you to be actionable. I want you to learn something and I want you to practice what you learn within the course. That's the whole goal. I don't want you to just sit there. It's something that you really need to follow through with and learn while you're at home. Now, when it comes to learning how to eat healthy, I think most people out here are going to do what I did. We're going to try to go it alone. We don't have the skills. We don't have the experience. Uh, we don't have the knowledge that we need to do it alone. So we're going to go on the internet and we're going to find all sorts of lists. Uh, and what, in your opinion, is the biggest mistake when people try to do it alone um, that they make or the biggest mistakes you see, the common mistakes? Well, one of the big ones I see right away is that people cut out too much food. They cut out too many things. And what this does is it essentially turns your nutrition, it turns your nutrition profile for yourself into what looks like Swiss cheese. It, it There are so many holes and so many gaps. And CKD is a chronic disease that lasts a lifetime. There's no cure for it. But what we can do is we can take care of the body so that the kidneys will be taken care of. And when people are restricting too much in certain nutrients and certain food groups and whatever the case is, what they're doing is that they're restricting nutrients from the body to be able to do things to protect the kidneys. So most often what our 
clients come to us with is that they've cut back so much and they have such low energy, they're not feeling well, and they don't know what's, what's wrong because they felt like, oh, I was supposed to avoid X, Y, and Z. I got the handouts that said no more potatoes, no more tomatoes, no more avocados. And I did that and now I don't feel good. It's because you're pulling back too much. And we in the course teach you how to track what to look for, what to talk with your healthcare team about to make sure you're on that right track and that you're getting enough nutrition into the body so that you're actually protecting the kidneys and not starving them. The kidneys do need nutrition. It's very, very important. And that's what we love teaching in PPK. And I'll tell you that that I'm, I'm so glad it's what you said. I knew that's what you would say. Yeah. Because <laughs> uh, I see it so many times and I did that. As a matter of fact, I started having muscle problems because I cut back sodium. Now, I was eating way too much. I was like the, the normal American, lots of fast food, all that highly, highly processed food loaded with sodium. And I tried, I know it's going to sound bizarre, I tried to go to zero sodium. And I got as close as I could, and I started having problems. And I went to the doctor, and he's like, you, you're too low. I did not realize that I knew too much was bad, but I didn't realize too little can be just as bad or even more dangerous, depending on mm -hmm. what you're going too low on. And I was so glad when I learned I could still have most of my favorite things. And I haven't had a Twinkie or anything like that. I used to <laughs> love those. Uh, but, but I have worked in some sweets. Uh, yeah. Maybe a few too many. <laughs> That's <not laughs> part of my scale. But I've learned how to enjoy food, which was great by working with the dietitian and learning how to eat, which is you know, just fantastic. Are there any other common mistakes that you see people make that when they learn about nutrition, when they work with the dietitian, it kind of, you know, oh, gives them some relief because it opens up more to them. Yeah, there's actually one that's kind of, um, it's a double-edged sword, and that is tracking your nutrition. Because we are a really big fan, dietitians are a really big fan of looking at your full nutrition breakdown, and that has to come from something like a food journal, a food log, even pictures, taking pictures of what you're eating so that we can see everything kind of adding up together. But sometimes I do notice, and this kind of goes to, it ties back in with that over restriction part is that sometimes people will hyper focus on certain areas of their nutrition. I'll say like potassium is a really big example because that is something commonly over concerning to people that they're missing out on other areas of opportunity to protect the kidneys, such as protein and prowl and sodium and fluids and gut health and carbohydrates and fiber and all of these other great things that they're so worried about their potassium. And they're so concerned if they go one milligram over a certain number that was arbitrarily picked, it was just, you know, something that Dr. Google said, then they're thinking, oh my gosh, this is going to be the end of it instead of looking at all these other things. And again, we like to focus on these different aspects at PPK with our students and our private clients to look at areas of opportunity. Where can we protect the kidneys? How can we protect the kidneys? Because our goal is kidney health. We do focus on kidney disease, but what we're really targeting, what we're aiming to measure is kidney health. And that comes in a variety of ways, not just how much potassium somebody ate. So yes, tracking is incredibly important. It provides a lot of feedback, but I, it breaks my heart when people get too into the numbers and too mm -hmm. hyper-focused on things that they kind of forget the bigger picture and they forget other things that they can be really taking advantage of. And we're all human. So we occasionally fall off the wagon. Um, mm -hmm. And when you learn about nutrition, you kind of learn, okay, don't make a habit of it, but it's going to yeah. happen and it's okay. You can adjust mm -hmm. for it. Um, here's when it really is serious and here's when it's not. So you learn not to panic or to, to, to beat yourself just because you went a little over some number that you found on the internet. Mm. I, I remember that was me. <laughs> 
I I would argue that everybody with CKD, I mean, I myself don't have it. So I'm speaking from like the book smart aspect of it. But I would definitely argue to say everybody, nearly everybody with CKD will go through those phases. So you're not alone. If you're out there thinking, oh my gosh, are they talking about me? Because I am way, way concerned about potassium right now. And I don't know why I was just told by something. Everybody goes through this. Everybody panics. Everybody's really, really concerned. And rightfully so. I mean, there has been a lot in our history and uh, even as dietitians in our history, there has been a lot of reason for concern about certain nutrients, but I've noticed what's happened is that it's getting kind of muddied out in the internet and it's getting blurry and people, <laughs> uh, one of my family members uh, was in the hospital and got a very generic old Xerox heavily copied handout and it said for ckd stages three through five and i'm thinking oh three four five like so you're trying to cover three different stages in one including one really bad one well i mean like so is it five on dialysis five not on dialysis like what what is going on here like it was it was and i knew the exact handout i'm very familiar with it but it just goes to show there's some things that are a little bit delayed they're a little bit behind and we are really working on increasing that knowledge for people to say, okay, this is what you need to look at. It's stage specific. It's cause specific. It's you specific. Just because two people have CKD3 doesn't mean they're on the same diet. It doesn't mean they have the same focus. It doesn't mean they have the same problems. They could both have blood sugar issues, but it doesn't mean that blood sugar is the top priority for each. Yeah. So, so true. Um, one thing that popped in my mind that I I want to make sure and, and address. So uh, PPK, plant-powered kidneys, does that mean I cannot eat meat? That if I take the program, I'm only going to learn about fruits and vegetables? Well, we do have a whole week dedicated to protein. It's actually going to be week two. We talk about protein. Um, and there are some people that do incorporate animal proteins in their diet. Uh, there's some who incorporate more or less or whatever the case is. Our goal is to teach people about how to include more plants. That's basically it. If we think about the old school food pyramid, and I'm thinking like for me, old school was when it had that base. Now it's like the vertical or the, yeah, the vertical lines for the food pyramid, but the old school was the horizontal lines mm -hmm. going across for the food groups. And that bottom part are fruits and vegetables. So we are thinking we want that base for everybody to be primarily fruits and vegetables. So no matter where you're at with eating animal proteins or eating animal foods, we want to at least get more fruits and vegetables into your diet while we're also teaching you about animal proteins. And we do cover the pros and cons with animal proteins. We talk about what to watch out for. We talk about some of the better options of animal proteins because not everybody should entirely eliminate animal proteins. So that's why it's not called the vegan kidney plan or anything like that. We're talking about just adding in more plants. And we've had plenty of students that talk about how they're still incorporating some animal proteins in from their choice, their perspective, whatever the case is. But they're also adding in more fruits and vegetables because we do provide six weeks of meal plans with all plant-based recipes. So they can kind of pick and choose from the recipes that we provide to incorporate those and be able to add in more plants, which again, that's that's the best thing. And ever since I became a dietitian, we want people to eat more fruits and vegetables no matter what's going on with their situation. So it's really, really exciting that we get to see literally hundreds of plant-powered kidney warriors that are going through this and eating better. And uh, it, it's just, it always, it lights me up every single day. Yeah, and I still, I eat chicken usually. That's what I add as meat. But what's what has changed for me from eating everything out of, you know, drive through and fast food or delivery is now I start with the vegetables and the fruit. Mm -hmm. So today my lunch was a salad. I made an awesome salad. I had strawberries. Mm -hmm. I had some, some walnuts on it, some sunflower seeds, um, and some other stuff in there. Nice, lots of different lettuces and stuff, but I start with the vegetables and fruit now. Yeah. And then yeah. I I kind of garnish it 
with the chicken. So I grilled a little bit mm-hmm. of chicken and I chopped it up. It actually was just like a very small chicken breast, not even a regular one. And I grilled it with some spices and chopped it up and mixed in the salad. And it was delicious. And the old way of me, when I first mm-hmm. started eating for my kidneys, it was, okay, I got to, what meat am I going to eat? And then I got to force in some vegetables. But I've learned, and now I start with the vegetables. And to me, when I do add some meat, it's, very, you know, not always, um, but it's usually chicken and it's a garnish. So I've kind of flipped them around where yeah. vegetables used to be whatever came between the bun and the hamburger for me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That That's a great, great example is once you kind of start to make that shift, it does get easier. At first it might be kind of weird or it takes a little bit like baby steps and that's okay. I mean, all of us are different and we learn different. We want to practice different. The point is we want to make it something that's sustainable because the biggest thing about a kidney protective diet is that this is not a fad. This is not a trend. This is not a short time fix. This is not, we are not promoting a six week program that you will take or you'll go through this program and then you'll go back to what you've been doing. That's not what we're doing. We're educating and helping support you in this six week transition so that at the end of it, you're going to feel super confident and you're going to feel motivated to continue the path that you're on into this newfound way of eating more plants to take care of your kidney health. So it is really that focus of thinking down down your your life path of what does this look like for me? How can I incorporate this? What kind of changes can I make? And how is this going to be something that I will continue to enjoy? And some people do take time to think about that because, you know, I would say depending on how we grew up, there's a lot of meat and potato Mm -hmm. people out there who say, you know, this is how I grew up. And it, it wasn't a meal without a big piece of meat there. And I didn't really see green on the plate very often. So in those cases, we're not talking about a full 180 switch to all salads and, you know, whatever fruits for snacks and everything. We're talking about, okay, so if we're looking at this meat and potato plate, How about we cut down that meat portion a little bit to make room for your favorite vegetable, whatever that is and however you enjoy it. It doesn't have to be raw. It doesn't even have to be fresh. We've had conversations with a lot of people about how frozen and canned vegetables are a great opportunity to get nutrition in. So whatever it looks like for you, that's still a win. And it is a huge win because the more you do that, the more you practice, that's when you get the ball rolling and you start to see results. And that is when, this is the greatest thing, you go to your nephrologist's office and they see your labs and they say, just keep doing what you're doing because they they see that you're on the right track, which is what we hear all the time from our students. <laughs> yeah. And, and, there are so many different types of vegetables that many of us have probably never heard of or never even tried. And Kelly here, oh, he mentioned a good one. He's added kimchi to his daily diet. Kelly, that mm-hmm. is awesome. You are a brave guy. Um, I I occasionally eat kimchi. Um, I love Korean food. Um, kimchi is one of those ones that, you know, your, your significant other isn't happy after you eat it, you know, it's, it's, it's a spicy food and, uh, it does something to you. Um, but I've also learned from you, like I was the meat and potato guy. Every meal had some kind of potato, you know, mm-hmm. it was a vegetable. So I chose a kind of potato. What was it? But one of the things I learned from you and I absolutely love making is in my air fryer, I take um, radishes, which I love radishes. I can eat them raw. To me, they're like little baby apples. I just love them. And mm-hmm. they're great in a salad, great in stir fry. But I did not realize this. And you told me about this. And I tried it. And I absolutely love it. I do it often. I take the the uh, radishes and I cut them. I cut the ends off. And then I also cut them up a, a little bit. So they're not as big. So that it cooks mm-hmm. through. I put them in the air fryer. And I don't know what chemical reaction happens. But they lose that spice. And... <laughs> They can taste like butter. I mean, sorry, they can taste like potatoes. You can put a little bit of butter on it, um, some other spices, or maybe some oil. And it is, it can fool you into thinking these are little red skin potatoes. It tastes so much like them. And I love having those with the meal. And I'll, 
you know, a bag of them is not that expensive and I'll cut them up. No, I'll put the yeah. whole bag in there, make it, the kids will enjoy it. It makes a great snack. It's to me, it's like a great potato replacement. I like it much better than cauliflower potatoes. Yeah. These are like little baked potatoes. Yeah. They're so good. They're, they're really quite addicting. And if you haven't, if you're watching us and you haven't tried them, roasting radishes, that's all you got to know. It is, it is so, so fantastic. And there's a lot of great opportunities for so many other vegetables. Cause I mean, if we think about the variety of vegetables that are out there, there are so many, I don't, I don't even know off the top of my head, how many there are, but I mean, just the variety that we have, there is bound to be a vegetable that you've forgotten that you like. And we talk about this with clients a lot because after we've worked together for a while, they kind of go through this food cycling where they get used to eating certain things and they forgot about how much they enjoyed. Like in your case, they're like, oh, roasted radishes. Like that's, I haven't made that in forever and it's so good. So then they get that back into their diet again. So think about something that maybe you enjoyed a while back or maybe something that's coming into season because we're hitting the springtime. There's going to be a lot of really good produce at the farmer's markets and the grocery stores. So maybe there's something that comes up that you can incorporate into your diet to give you a variety of nutrients coming from the different colors and then coming from all the different types of plants that we have. It's a really, really good time to be experimenting and trying out new or or revisiting some of your previous favorite ones. Yep. And we have a couple questions here. I'm going to pop up. Yeah. Um, here's one about peanut butter. She's pretty much asking which kind of peanut butter is she actually describes the perfect one. Uh, when you're looking for peanut butter or you're helping people to find peanut butter, what do you tell them to look for? So my go-to is any brand, any brand that has one ingredient in there, which is peanuts. That's really what peanut butter is. That's what it should be. So if you can find a peanut butter in your grocery store that only has one ingredient, that's going to be really, really great. It won't have added salt. It won't have added oil. It won't have added sugar. Now, I know not everybody has these options in the grocery store. So if you can't find a peanut butter that only has peanuts in it, the next I would start looking at is peanuts and salt. And then the salt start comparing the sodium levels on the ingredient list to see which one you can find that's the lowest sodium option. That would be like my second place recommendation. And then we start getting into the other ones that have added oils, which we are okay with oils at Plant Powered Kidneys. I know that's a big conversation that comes up every now and then. Oils can be a great part of a diet to incorporate enough calories, but it doesn't necessarily need to be added into something like peanut butter. But if you find it, try to look for something that doesn't have too much oil in it, maybe the lowest amount in the ingredients or the lowest amount of fat, because peanuts do, they are a source of fat and they're healthy fats that are being provided. But when they're adding oils, they're adding extra fat on there. So that would be my order of, of preference is first look for one that's only peanuts. And then if you can't find that, then look for one that's only peanuts and salt. And then if you can't find that, then peanut salt and the lowest amount of oil possible. Yeah. And I'll tell you every store, at least that I shop at, um, Walmart, uh, uh, Meyer, uh, Kroger, they all have a store brand that's usually labeled natural mm -hmm. and all of them have it with just peanuts. And then they also have the peanut and salt version, which makes it very affordable, um, mm -hmm. And I love it. It's a great snack. I can add it to some celery or some carrots or uh, mix it into, if I if I make a smoothie, which is not very often, uh, but I like to put a little bit of peanut butter in there. Uh, I get a, I get kind of crazy with my smoothies. I'm still learning how to make them. So <laughs> come out looking and tasting a bit weird. And you're like, hey, I, I put 250 of strawberries in there. I'm, I'm drinking this thing no matter what. <laughs> Well, I do see some other questions that are kind of in the same context. So just really quick, um, if somebody asked about almond butter, looks like Will asked about almond butter. There are tons of nut butters, which is a really cool thing. And more companies are adding in more nut butter options, which is great for allergies that you can do a substitution. So in general, the different types of nut butters are typically going to be okay. Just keep in mind that nut butters are very calorie dense. A little goes a long way because if you think about how much peanuts or almonds or cashews or hazelnuts, whatever it would take to blend up, 
a lot of it gets condensed into a small amount. So it's only a couple of tablespoons per serving. So keep that in mind. But I think it is a great option to try a variety. I think cashew butter is great. I think almond butter is great. Peanut butter is great. Hazelnut butter is great. There's macadamia nut butter. I mean, there are so many options out there. So again, it's a great opportunity to play around, try some out, see what you like. You don't have to like all of it. You don't have to eat all of it, but see what is enjoyable to you because that's the way a healthy renal or a healthy kidney protective diet is going to stick. Very good. Yeah. If you a diet, the, a lot of people ask me often, James, what's the best diet? And I always say the first thing is one that you can stick with. Uh, if yeah. you're going to hate the diet, doesn't matter what it is. It ain't going to work because you're going to give mm-hmm. up on it. <laughs> mm-hmm. And then the second thing is it's individualized to you. You're not just taking a pamphlet and following that only. Um, now, here's one you may not know. Um, maybe you do. Brian asks, when you cook lentils, do you reduce the potassium in it? Or would you, so, yeah, or would you treat those more like potatoes and I forgot what that's yeah. called. Leaching. There, it's leaching. Yeah. So there is some potassium reduction in cooking lentils. Um, I don't remember the exact number, but I know we have an article about it on plant powered kidneys. Um, we have plenty of, of free resources for people that are looking for help. Um, I know it's in, it's the chickpea recipe or chickpea one. Um, and I'm going to be searching this. So this is kind of an example of what our live Q and A's can be like when we're chatting and somebody asks me a question and I say, let me find it for you. And then we pull up resources and share it with everybody in the program. Um, okay. So yes, we do have an article. It's potassium and chickpeas. And we do discuss the different types of, um, the, the different types of cooking methods. And then we actually have a comparison for the different types of chickpeas and against beans and legumes per half cup serving. Um, and we do have an article in there that also covers uh, some information about what it looks like to reduce the potassium. If potassium, and I always have to say this because remember, not everybody needs to limit their potassium. If you do need to limit your potassium, one of the best options would be the canned lentils. The canning process leaches out a good amount of potassium. So when you buy the canned ones, look for a low sodium or no, well, probably not no added salt because I feel like anything that's canned beans or canned legumes that are no added salt, it's cruel. So yeah. let's just do the low, let's do the low sodium option. And then you rinse and drain or drain and rinse them out really well. And then they're good to eat and they're already cooked. You don't even have to boil them. If you don't want to, you can add them to salads. You can mash them up and put them onto a sandwich. You can add it into a, a stew or a soup. So if you're looking for like the most potassium control, the canned options are going to be your best bet. Awesome. Uh, here's a couple other great questions that if anyone out there, if you have a question, put it in here. Even if you're not watching the live, uh, we may see those questions and it gives us things to talk about in the future. Or you may get a response to your question from us or from somebody else in our community. Kath, Kathleen asked, what if any breads might be okay to include in a renal diet? Oh, I My heart goes out because of the if any, I remember thinking uh, that. Yeah, I think you're, yeah. she's going to be surprised by your answer. Oh yeah, I mean there are definitely there are plenty of breads that are out there that are definitely fine for CKD. So the old school thought was white bread was the best option. However, we know now that the whole grain breads are actually our best bet, and that's because they come with more nutrients. One of those important nutrients is fiber. The renal diet is traditionally very low in fiber, and that's not good for our gut health. It's not good for our kidney health. So a whole grain option is going to be a really great bet, but you want to be really careful with the sodium in the bread. The American Heart Association has a group of foods called the Salty Six. They're the six saltiest types of foods in the American diet. And bread is in that category. They, they earn that honor of being one of the saltiest foods. And I've seen some really high salt breads and we don't typically taste it. We don't realize it, but you know, it's not very common for somebody to have just one slice of bread at a meal. For example, you make a sandwich, you do a couple of slices of toast for breakfast it's usually, they usually come in pairs. So that means that whatever that sodium content is, you've got to double it for your meal. 
And, and, and I've that's kind of tricky that they do it yeah. per slice. You, I, I noticed yeah. that. I'm like, what? <laughs> exactly. And I've seen sandwiches go into the seven, eight, 900 milligrams for that one sandwich, not even the whole meal, just the sandwich in part because of that really high sodium bread. I've seen breads in like the 300 milligram per slice. That's 600 milligrams before you even put anything between That's, the slices yeah. of bread. And if you may, if you go with one of those like impossible burgers or something, which are just loaded with sodium, kind of pretending yeah. to be healthy, all of a sudden you could be at almost, you know, over almost over half of your day's sodium in one little sandwich. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so definitely be careful with when you're looking at the breads in, in the bread aisle or in the bakery, make sure you're looking for sodium. That's really, really important. And definitely go for something that's whole grain so that you get more nutrients coming from that food. It's going to be a, a much better option for you. Yeah, and I found it easier now than it was a few years ago to find lower sodium bread. But one mm -hmm. thing I did that... Uh, I absolutely loved it. It may not be available to everyone, but a long time ago, my wife and I, we had a restaurant and we got our bread made every day and delivered and all sorts of stuff made. Nice. So I actually went to one of the local bakeries here in Northern Cincinnati <clears throat> and I let them know I'm looking for some bread that's low sodium. They, like, hey, we can make some for you. Uh, and they made up all sorts of great bread. It, it was competitively priced with buying a loaf of bread in the store, but I got yeah. it made fresh. I wasn't loaded with salt. Uh, I could actually taste the difference. You don't really taste the salt, but when bread has less sugar and less salt in it, I, you can tell. Um, but it was fantastic. The only downside was um, it wasn't loaded with preservatives, so you couldn't. it didn't last as long. So yeah. I would just get yeah, a small I, loaf. And we, the whole family, yeah. we'd eat it and go through it. And we were uh -huh. good. So, yeah, yeah, that's great. Yeah, the negative was it didn't last as long, but it was because it wasn't loaded with preservatives, which is great. <laughs> yeah, we typically, we've, we've been freezing our bread and that's just kind of the way that we can keep it a little bit longer. Um, but, you know, there, there is kind of that, uh, I guess the, the pros and cons or that toss up or that sacrifice of, you know, oh dang, no more preservatives, but, you've got to make sure that you're including it in your diet and that you eat it or that you preserve it or you freeze it or something to, to keep it there. Um, I've seen a few comments about the, the no sodium or the low sodium, like Ezekiel bread or something. I will say that is when I did notice a total absence of sodium. <laughs> so personally, I can't do it. If, if, if you like that bread, it has zero milligrams of just salt. Just get a little, um, just a little. That's, that, that's it how it was no with, with the baker for me. <laughs> It, I, when I did the zero, it did not work just no, a little yeah. and it was fine. Yeah. I would look for like a, less than 120 milligrams. If you can find something around hundred or 90 milligrams per slice, I think that's a really good option. Um, cause that's going to give you just a little bit. Um, cause yeah, once you try it with like a zero milligrams, then you notice the difference. Then you taste it like, Oh, okay. Yeah. There's, there's something to it. <laughs> <laughs> now Deb asks this is a fantastic question. Which is better, juicing or smoothies? What's oh, your Deb, thoughts that on is, that? Yeah, that's a great question. So I think both can fit if you like, but I'm gonna I'm gonna vote for the smoothies because the smoothie has the fiber. When a when when something is juiced, you're literally just squeezing out the liquid of that item. So you're not going to get the fiber, which is really, really important for us. I think even right now tonight alone, we've talked about fiber half a dozen times. It's incredibly important. So juicing will not have the fiber that a smoothie does when you blend up the entire when you blend up the entire drink. So that's what I would recommend. The other thing about juice that people don't always realize is how high in potassium it can be. Even the ones that are typically thought of as being a lower potassium, like apple juice, for example, we think of apples, they are a lower potassium fruit, but apple juice can be pretty high in potassium. Because if you think about how many apples does it actually take to make a glass of juice, it's quite a lot. And you probably wouldn't sit down to eat that many apples, but it's easy to drink a glass of apple juice coming from that many apples. So 
with the juice, just be really careful about how frequently you include it. The recommendation is no more than four ounces, which is a small amount, you guys. It's a, it's a small amount. <laughs> I don't think I've and ever no, seen a four ounce cup unless it's those little paper ones your kids use in the bathroom. <laughs> I was going to say, yeah, they're the kiddo ones that, you know, adults are going to be like, I'm sorry, this is for me. So, you know, in the restaurants, they're going to serve you like a mug of juice or like a pint of juice. It's a lot. And that can be three to four times the recommended amount, which is then three to four times the recommended amount of potassium. And even though it is natural sugar, which, you know, fruit has natural sugar in it. I'm again, not a big fan of getting so much of that natural sugar without the other components of the fruit, like the fiber and the other nutrients that will be helpful in taking care of blood sugars, taking care of the kidneys, taking care of the body. So with the juice, I would say just be careful. Um, if you can pick the smoothies, that that would be my go-to. I, I always hear the voice of my dietitian telling me, try not to drink your calories whenever I see like juice. It's like, there's a lot of calories in it too because of that, yeah. all the sugar and it's all concentrated in there. And, oh, I haven't had juice in so long. I don't miss it. I'm, I'm good with yeah. flavored waters. Yeah, I, I, I'm also kind of the same way. I'm not, I've never really been a juice person. Um, but if you are a juice person watching us, then you could try something like infusing your water with that fruit that you enjoy. So you could cut up a couple pieces of apple or orange or pineapple or mango or throw a few berries in there and let it sit in your water and it will infuse that natural flavor into your water. So you get a hint of flavor from whatever fruit you put in there. And that can be a really great way to stay hydrated, give enough water for your kidneys, uh, which is really, really important as well. Yeah, and I bought this teeny tiny little handheld mixer on Amazon, it was dirt cheap. Um, it, it's not very long, but I'll put it in a cup, some water, and I'll put a couple black cherries in there. Oh my mm. goodness, those things are delicious. And just bzz, bzz, just gotcha. a little bit, it kind of, it doesn't, pulverize it but it chops them up a bunch then i'll add it in here and fill it up the rest way with water and oh my goodness it is incredible the flavor i get out of just like a couple cherries into 52 ounces of water it yeah to me, if i put like three of them in there i'm like in heaven i'm like oh this is like a dessert <laughs> yeah and you can even do like frozen cherries and you put those in there and it kind of cools down the water so it acts like an ice cube. For those of you that are maybe on a fluid restriction and that you're being told that you can't drink very much water, this is a really good trick to prevent that ice cube melting because that adds more water in your drink. But if you use frozen fruit, especially like big chunks that take a longer time to thaw, that is a great way to add flavor and to not add extra water in your drink. So again, just like the potassium restriction, not everybody needs to be limiting their fluids. But if your doctor has told you, or if your dietitian has told you, it is a very, very important thing to do. Awesome. Now, Will asked a question, which is going to lead me to a, a, another question that's similar to it. He asked about what about reducing sodium for egg rolls? Uh, what are some tips to help people reduce sodium because we do get in general far too much mm -hmm. and eating healthier requires learning how to eat a reasonable amount of sodium i'm actually now surprised how much sodium i can eat um and i can't believe how much i used to eat so what are some tips to help people in reducing sodium yeah, this is a really, really common question. This is a really common issue because the majority of us get about a thousand plus milligrams of sodium a day on top of what we should be having. So most people are already following a high sodium diet, but most people should be following a low sodium diet because of all the implications that salt, excess salt can cause in our health. So in the conversation of egg rolls, it really depends, number one, on where you're getting them from or how you're getting them. So if you're going to a restaurant, you're not going to be able to ask them to change their egg roll order because they're probably pre-made. But what you could do is look for the lowest sodium soy sauce if you're going to dip them. Ideally, tamari, um, sometimes tamari will be low sodium, sometimes coconut aminos will be low sodium as well but it's not guaranteed to be low sodium. I myself have made that mistake of grabbing coconut aminos really quick off the shelf in the grocery store 
only later to realize that they were actually just as high as regular soy sauce. So make sure you check all the labels. Don't assume that something is going to be low sodium. You've got to read the labels. But if you're going to be dipping into your egg roll into something, the coconut aminos or maybe tamaro, tamari could be a good option for you. So that would be the first thing I would recommend. If you have the ability to shop around for your egg roll, let's say you're looking in the grocery store, you're looking in the freezer section, start by looking at the labels there and see if you can find some maybe that are like spring rolls that have more vegetables because even the meat, the animal meat that is inside certain egg rolls, that can be processed and additional sodium as well. So try looking for one that's like a veggie spring roll and that could potentially, not guaranteed of course, but that could potentially help lower the sodium for you there too. And then finally, if you are a wizard chef at home and you are making your own egg rolls, you can really control it that way by choosing fresh ingredients or using any type of maybe like a, a kimchi or something, look for the low sodium options for anything that you do have that's coming out of a container. It's coming out of a jar or a can, look for those low sodium levels. So there's different kind of tiers of what we can look at. But um, I know in the restaurants, typically gonna be where most people enjoy egg rolls. So you're gonna have limited options there. See if you can do a spring roll instead and that could be one of your best bets too. I'll tell you, anyone out there who's a chef at making egg rolls, come over for a visit. I, I know, yeah. Oh my <laughs> goodness. And then I make like a mango sauce. It's it's mm-hmm. it's pretty bad. It's like, you know, uh, very, uh, I learned it in Louisiana. It's a Louisiana sauce you make with mangoes. I love that instead of soy sauce. But oh, I, I can down me a huh. plate of egg rolls. Ooh, that and deviled yeah. eggs. Oh, watch your fingers. <laughs> <laughs> I was just talking with a group of uh, students a couple of weeks ago about making their own um, spring rolls at home using the rice paper wrappers. And you can get them usually in like the, at an Asian supermarket or even in like the Asian section of a grocery store, the rice paper wrappers are super easy to use. And you basically put whatever you want in there and you wrap them up all nice and tight, like a little mini burrito. And it's all about the dipping sauce. I I've made a really good, a uh, ginger carrot miso dipping sauce, fantastic. It actually, we blend the carrots with fresh ginger and some garlic and a little bit of coconut aminos. It's so good. And that's really where it's at for me. Whatever it's, whatever the vehicle is, it's just carrying the sauce to my mouth. <laughs> exactly. The, the egg roll is for the sauce to bring it up. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. <laughs> there was one. Oh, so in helping reduce sodium, um, what are some alternatives? And we've got about 10 minutes left. What are some alternatives a person can use instead of grabbing the salt shake? I mean, we got the, we got the salt alternatives. There's other things. What do you recommend as a dietitian that kidney patients look for to use instead of salt? Well, I mean, oh my goodness, there are so many. It is, it is incredible. Just like how we were talking about the amount of vegetables that are available to us, there are an innumerable amount of, of herbs and spices that we can add, whether they're fresh or dried, or even in those little bottles in the uh, produce area that you can use, and they're already kind of good to go there. You can mix them into sauces or whatever you're making they provide a great amount of flavor and we can a flavor and we can think about the uh the aromatic type of vegetables like garlics and leeks and chive and even onion these kinds of things can add a ton of flavor so if you're cooking something at home and let's say it calls for two cloves of garlic it's totally up to you if you want to add four cloves of garlic i mean i do that all that's just a regular tuesday night for me is adding extra garlic <laughs> But it's totally up to you on including more flavor in that way that doesn't include salt at all. So you can double down on your garlic. You can add an extra handful of chopped onion. You can throw some chives on top or or chop up some dill, shredding up some parsley or basil, cilantro. There are so many great herbs and flavors out there that you can incorporate to give more flavor so that you're not you're not thinking, oh man, I need more salt on this. And then another thing you can do too is serve your meal with a slice or two of lemon or lime because that is going to give you, yeah, that's going to give you a really great burst of flavor and it's a bright, fresh flavor. 
And you all know, I mean, if we take a second right now and just envision biting into a lemon, your mouth waters. Like it creates that savory sensation and it gives a really great flavor to things that maybe you didn't realize would be so helpful. So I think citrus, having that on hand, I mean, we have a big jar of, of lemons that's sitting in water in our fridge, just being preserved there because we pull out a lemon and then just chop it up and serve it with our meal. And it's so easy. Yeah, I, I'll tell you, lemon and lime are probably my two most used liquid flavored additives. Um, and I now have so many spices, I feel like a chef. When I, I'm, sitting, I'm digging through, I'm like, oh, no, 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 this, oh, this is, I'm going to try this, yeah. I'm mixing up. Oh, my goodness, I've discovered so much amazing things. My biggest challenge, and I think many of you out there will have the same one, is many times I have made something and it is like incredibly good. And I'm like, what the heck did I put in this? I have no <laughs> clue. I just started mixing some things and I've got something you great. Got carried away. <laughs> and I don't know how to reproduce it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, oh yeah. Well, that's just like, you know, it makes me think of those clients that they went through their food cycles and they're like, oh yeah, I totally remember. I used to make that and then like, how did I do that? And, and they're kind of like, okay, well, now we got to go back to the drawing board and kind of figure this out. But that's the fun of being in the kitchen and practicing cooking. Cooking is a skill. Cooking is not something that we are all born to do and to understand and to be really good at. So it takes practice. It takes time. And not everything will come out as a masterpiece. I know we, we've talked about that before, James, that it, it just, it takes practice and you do want to learn what you like and what you don't like. Uh, the important thing is to not give up. Don't think that when, if you tried making something and you added lemon to it and then you're like, oh, that was awful. Lemon is the worst. This whole thing is so bad. Maybe it was just not the right combination. Maybe it wasn't the right mix, but maybe lemon will work really well on a different recipe that you have or being used with some different vegetables or whatever the case is. So don't, don't eliminate all possibilities. If you have one experience that wasn't so, you know, you're not the Michelin five star, or whatever it is, chef out there. <laughs> and, and there was a time when I would not have known what that is, but I watch a lot of Ramsey, uh, Gordon Ramsey. So I know what that is. And Margaret says she cooks like me. She has no clue what she did. And sometimes it's absolutely amazing. Um, Teresa asked is, True lemon packets, okay for seasoning. I use those, Teresa, when I steam vegetables. Uh, because putting in the liquid lemon, first of all, it's hard to get a lot of it all over them. So I use the 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 true lemon. It's just freeze-dried, dehydrated lemon. Um, I sprinkle that on when I'm going to like uh, put things in the air fryer or steam vegetables or something like that because it sticks and then it eventually dissipates. But... The flavor doesn't go away just like adding liquid lemon juice or something like that. Then I always squirt lemon when I take it out. Um, I love <laughs> asparagus. Oh, my goodness. I I mm. can eat asparagus for every meal, except it's not good when you eat a whole bunch of it. If you have problems with, with gout or, and things like that, <laughs> it fights against you. But, yeah, uh, yeah, you got to be careful. I love that. All yeah, right, we I'm have having about, that tonight for dinner. <laughs> oh, asparagus? Yeah. Oh, I love asparagus. I, I buy it frozen and they got the bags where you can steam it in there in the microwave, which is great. So I'll have the air fryer going, making something in there, and then I'll just do some asparagus in the microwave. Um and I'll put in some of the the the, the lemon on it. Um and have me a delicious meal. I also like cooking it, cutting up, mixing it in stir fry, or cooking it, cutting it up, throwing it into a salad, which I you know, mm -hmm. three years ago, I would have said, what in the world? But I love it. Yeah, I think my favorite way for asparagus is either air frying it or roasting it or grilling it. It's got to have, I like that. I like those little, the charred pieces or I like the, I like the, um, I don't know, something about that, that type of dry heat cooking to me. That's really, really great for asparagus. And I'm really excited that it's going to be grilling season soon. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. Oh, all right. Here's a great question. And we'll, we'll make this our last question of the evening. Maeve asks, are there any fruits or vegetables to be avoided? Well, there's really only one in particular that we say across the board is not okay for CKD. Everything else is fair game. Everything else is something that can be a conversation. And we can talk about how to work it into your diet 
whatever that looks like, whether it's something you can have every meal or every day or every other day. And really before depends. you say it, let's see if anyone can guess <laughs> what it is. We've okay. talked about it before. It is whenever anyone says, what should I avoid? I say this, you should avoid yeah. this because it's, it's got a, it's toxic, especially if you have bad kidneys, mm -hmm. it's bad for you. Uh, everything else that comes down to your labs and, and portion control. So let's see yeah. if anyone can guess what this um, fruit or vegetable is. As a matter of fact, I yeah. just saw some this Saturday. There we go, Maryland star right fruit. Away. Yay! Yeah, so star fruit does have a neurotoxin that the kidneys aren't able to filter, and it can be harmful for CKD in any stage. It can be really, really harmful for people who have little to no function. So somebody on dialysis, that would be really, really dangerous. So we say no star fruit, which you know, thankfully it's not something that's as common as like bananas in a lot of parts. Uh, there's some parts of the country that it is common as bananas, but you really, really want to just avoid star fruit. We don't want to have problems with the kidneys, everything else. Again, it's all about what you enjoy, what you want to include in the diet. And then we figure it out and put the whole puzzle together for you. That's the goal. We want you to enjoy the foods that you're going to want to have to protect your kidney function. Awesome. All right. Well, that pretty much brings us to the top of the hour. Great conversation. Uh, now, to learn more about plant-powered kidneys and the course that you do and everything else that you guys provide, I encourage everyone to go to plantpoweredkidneys.com. There'll be a link in the description. Or there is a link in the description below. Also, make sure and join Jen's Plant Powered Kidneys Facebook group. Not only are people helping each other, but more importantly, they're making up food, taking pictures, putting the recipes, talking about it. Here's what I changed. Here's what I liked. Here's what was awesome. Don't go there hungry, okay? That's that's my only oh, yeah, no. warning. Don't go there hungry. There's so many great pictures, so many great recipes and ideas in there. Make sure you guys do join those. And Jen will be back next month. And now next week. We have Shelby from Plant Powered Kidneys. Yeah, she'll be dear here. Shelby. Yeah, yeah. I'm so thrilled that she'll be back on here with you guys. She's one of our dietitians, and she's she's been with me ever since she was an intern, and she's gone through, and and uh, we've been working together for a few years now. So I'm thrilled that she's able to connect with you all because she and she'll actually be um she'll be a part of this next Plant Powered Kidneys mm -hmm. course. She, because she enjoys the cardiovascular blood pressure side, she's going to host our live Q&A session about sodium and fluid. So, uh, you know, if you want to connect with Shelby more, she's also going to be a part of the course too. Awesome. All right, everybody. I will see you all next week. Be here with Shelby. I'm also doing um, another conversation on a different channel. I'll be posting about that on the 14th. That's two days. It's a big surprise. Um, I'll be someplace else. Talk, only a 20-minute show, so it's going to be very little of me talking. <laughs> it's only 20 uh, James, minutes. We, we have never been able to master a short show like that. Good luck. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Like, woo! All right, everybody. Thank you so much, and we'll see you in the next video. Bye, everyone.